You're listening to Make It Big, a podcast about all things e-commerce, created by Big Commerce. Hi, everyone. I'm Taylor Stockwell, VP of Marketing at Big Commerce. Today, we're exploring how to enhance shopper experiences using augmented and virtual reality. And I have two amazing experts on the subject joining me, Mark Ubel, VP of Marketing at 3Kit, and Lindsay Scoggins, founder of Lindsay Scoggins Studio. Welcome, Lindsay and Mark. It's great to have you guys here. Good to be here. Thanks, Taylor. Yeah, thank you. I love it. I'm super excited about this conversation because one of the challenges that we see quite often are merchants struggling with how do you really create an effective shopper experience and how do you do stuff that's innovative? There's a lot of I think really cool innovation that's coming that can help around shopper experience that facilitates better shopping, better e-commerce, and a whole bunch of really cool stuff. And you guys are at the forefront of it. And so, Mark, I want to start with you. You're with 3Kit, and you guys focus in the augmented and virtual reality space, but you have a really cool origin story. And I'd love to hear how you guys got started. I'd like to explore a little bit more about what is AR and VR, how 3Kit got started, and some of your experiences around moving into e-commerce and the e-commerce space. Absolutely. Most people are familiar with movies. That's sort of the easiest way to start. And so, you know, our company started with 3D and CGI, which is sort of an interesting place to start. But 3D just kind of became a thing on the internet in about 2018. So you have to go back a little ways to see where it started. Our founder started in Hollywood in 2005, being a designer for Hollywood films like uh, Avatar, Titanic. And really, when you see that CGI of something exploding, that's really just 3D artistry. And so, you know, he was huge in that industry for about 10 or 15 years. And it wasn't until about 2016, 2017, when people could actually show products online using 3D. And 3D is an interesting thing to think about. It's 3D, a 3D object can be shown as a photo or an augmented reality or in virtual reality, or it's just a 3D object that you can spin and zoom in and play with. And so it's a much richer tool than say a photo, which a photo can only go, you know, a photo is only a 2D image, right? You can't change that thing very easily. And so we have these roots in Hollywood in movies and this really sort of high poly design And then now taking that into an e-commerce space, because now with tools like, you know, the Internet, um, but also now increasingly, um, you know, virtual reality goggles like Oculus or um, as augmented reality becomes a a computing platform that, you know, Facebook or Apple is looking at. um, People should really be thinking about how do I show my product in a 3D way? Because that's what these new platforms use is 3D objects. How, How do you guys define the difference between AR and VR? Right. Where's where's the line between those two things? Right. So augmented reality is using a device that is placing objects inside of the space that you already see. Right. So if you hold up your phone, you're still seeing your office like you're going to take a picture. But now you're able to place things into that scene or things appear in that scene. Um, the most notable is like Pokemon Go, a video game. So uh, if you're trying to capture uh, Pikachu, Pikachu shows up in your office and you can see Pikachu jumping around your office. Mm -hmm. Now, virtual reality is fully immersive. So you put on a headset and that is a fully immersive scene, um, where, you know, it might not have anything to do with the, you know, the office that you're sitting in, it could be, you're sitting in a forest. And so those are, it's like slightly immersive versus fully immersive with virtual reality. Got it. So Mark, do we see AR and VR at any time converging? Like, is there a really hard line between those two things? Or or at some point, are we going to see some sort of hybrid where you have a pseudo immersive experience between AR and VR? You know, it looks like from what we're seeing that those two are going to stay separate for for a while. Everything that we see is virtual reality is this platform that's mainly used for gaming right now. And right now, augmented reality is more of like a a more broad use case. It's used for Snapchat, for games, for e-commerce. And so it's AR feels more immediate, like over the next five years, this could be a, you know, every single human is using augmented reality daily. Whereas VR feels like we are 10 or 15 years away from 
everyone using VR daily. And that world is more what people call like the metaverse, which is like you could be living your entire life inside of a VR headset. And I think we're 10, 15 years away from that, whereas we're more like five years away from an augmented reality where people are using that to live, shop, work, play. And um, it's it's an in-between where you're seeing digital things inside of your, your space, mm-hmm. but you're still seeing your space most of the time. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, which is great. And it's especially good for a shopping experience. So Lindsay, I want to, I want to ask you really just a few questions first about how you got started a little bit about you and what you do. And I'll preface it by saying, you know, Lindsay, you make some of the most beautiful jewelry I've ever seen <laughs> ever. I've just go through your your site and I'm just looking at these designs and um, there's no other word other than beautiful. I mean, it's just amazing. And so I, I actually have some questions a little bit later about that transition between being a creative and, and being a, an e-commerce owner. But first, tell us about you and your studio and what you do and kind of your origin story and how you got into, into e-commerce. I actually started in the jewelry industry right out of college. Jewelry has been my whole career for 18 years. And I started at the corporate level. So I was doing jewelry on a very massive scale. I got a degree in architecture and I was brought up in a very creative family and I would paint with my grandmother every week. So I was looking for a career that would let me be creative, but also kind of let me explore the commerce. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't intend to get into jewelry, but I was fortunate enough to be like geographically located near the largest jeweler in North America at the time. I started working there through a series of events. I stayed there for 10 years and I learned every facet of the business from the supply chain to sourcing to product development to merchandising to inventory management. It was it was all there. That was a really great stepping stone for me to figuring out, you know, what do I really want to do when it's my time to decide where my career should go. And my personal life brought me to New York in 2012. I transitioned to the supply chain side. So I ran product development for a major supplier and did licensing. And so that you just opened up um, a lot more experience for me on how the jewelry is actually really made. And being in New York, it's the center of the jewelry universe in the United States. So the craft that's available here, the artisans that are here, I was just in love with making very, very special things, which is the opposite of what I had done for the previous 10 years. And so in 2016, I actually started my own line because I wanted to work directly with private clients. And so I went from this like very massive scale to a smaller scale to an even smaller scale, probably the most intimate you can get. And so I opened my studio in 2017. You know, I have private clients that come in here and we work and I design for them. And the part that they love about the experience is the process of bringing it to life. That's when I decided, you know, how am I going to scale my own business now? I decided I can only scale it if I can keep the experience very seamless with what I'm actually offering in person. Mm -hmm. And I happened to meet three kid around that same time. Yeah, that's great. When you were going through that process of transitioning into the corporate world, after having been, you know, more on the creative design side with your, you know, your education, and then you come into the corporate world and you're learning, you know, how this stuff gets made. Was that interesting to you? Like, did you really enjoy that process or did you feel like it disconnected you more from some of those creative, you know, desires that you had wanted to follow? I loved it. I loved it from day one because it wasn't just, you know, it wasn't taking me away necessarily. I mean, I will say the first question I asked when I walked into the door at my first job was, where does the design team sit? And the answer was, there's not a design team. Mm. And so that was very, that was the, the one thing I remember thinking, why, why are we such a big company? We don't have a design team. But I quickly learned that it was very much a more of a development than a design that kind of went into every piece that we sold. So it it was interesting, but I, I really loved every single part of purchasing process, the sourcing process, the, you know, coming in every day and seeing what sold the previous day. I loved every part of it. Yeah. You have a nice background of bridging both sides, like the creative side and the business side. Right. And I think that's, that's super unique about you. I really love what you said of, Hey, 
I went down from almost mass produced, probably not mass produced, but close to mass produced down to a one-on-one type of delivery environment. Now, how can I do that as an e-commerce merchant and scale that? And that seems to be the mindset that you went in. I think a lot of us struggle and a lot of e-commerce merchants struggle on how do we really create these personal experiences as they're interfacing with us and them with a computer in between. What did your experience look like before you saw 3Kit and what were some of the drivers for you to change and shift to reach that ideal that you had of creating those scalable one-on-one experiences? So I had seen other, you know, other jewelers, other jewelry companies attempt to do, you know, this rendering application and uh, kind of a build your own application. And it was really, that was really kind of like e-commerce 1.0 for the jewelry industry was pick this, pick that, we'll put it together, we'll assemble it for you, and then we'll ship it. I remember when I first started, I would have former managers of mine that I would call on for just advice and things. And they're like, how do you scale custom? Mm -hmm. And I would say, I'm not quite sure yet, but I'm sure I'll figure it out. But right now I have have the luxury of a little bit of time to figure out what the scaling opportunity is. And so I had a lot of jewelry companies have done this build your own um, in different ways. And my, you know, hesitation was just kind of doing the same thing was always that it felt like the tech was ahead of the actual merchandise. It was the the tech was in in at the forefront of the experience. I'm a jewelry maker. I make jewelry. I want people to feel like they're actually immersed with the jewelry. I'm not just, you know, a cool rendering that really doesn't look like the finished piece, but it looks enough like it to get away with not having to make the inventory. There's so many different ways to render a a product, but it was truly a serendipitous thing that I ran into a contact of mine who is at 3Kit. And (laughs) he's like, I work with 3Kit. And I said, what is 3Kit? He said, we do this great rendering software. And I was like, I need you to come to my office tomorrow at 1030. He was like, "Um, okay. He was in town for, I guess, like 24 hours or something. So we came and I explained what I was trying to do. He was like, that's what we do. So it was it was really nice. Yeah, that's really great. I love it. Mark, and I, maybe I should ask Lindsay this too, either one of you. We haven't really talked about what experience you created on your site for your shoppers. I'd love perspective from both of you guys. What was done? What was created and what makes it unique and different? I knew that I wanted to replicate as much as I could of the in-person experience as possible. And so what I do when clients come into my studio is I sketch with them and we talk mm-hmm. about gemstones and diamonds and we source diamonds and some, some things are technical and some things are more creative, but that's the part that fascinates people. And it, and it should, because it's a very fun process. As I was working with clients, I was realizing, you know, I have two pretty different sets of clients. I have the female self-purchaser who wants that very, very one of a kind, cool, unique piece of jewelry. And then I have my bridal clients. My engagement rings tend to sell for about four and a half times the national average. So they're definitely looking for something special, but aesthetically, they're looking for something still with a traditional look, but with a contemporary twist. And so from there, that kind of led me to develop what I call my signature designs, which end up being um, utilized very nicely in the virtual studio that we created with 3Kit. And so when we created it, I knew that I didn't want just a um, mix and match type of thing. I wanted it to be very, very curated with unique pieces, but also the sketch process was so important to me. So we came up with this really beautiful kind of sketch pad effect as you're designing a ring. You may not be able to see this if you're listening in, but it's this idea of going through and on the right-hand side of the screen is, it looks like a sketch of the ring. So it really is modeling what Lindsay would be doing in the studio as you're configuring various parts of the ring, whether that be, is it rose gold or gold or platinum? You know, what type of stone, what type of shape, the setting, all of these things. And to be able to just really seamlessly be able to turn and examine the drawing, and then it finally renders into a totally perfect 
rendering of what that ring would even look like, it does a nice job of showing what it would actually look like in the studio, except now you actually get to see the full ring, not just a drawing of it. Yeah, we should tell our listeners right now, go to lindsayscoggins.com. <laughs> we'll, we'll, do the, we'll do the plug. Go to lindsayscoggins.com yes. and then go into the engagement ring studio, right? Is that the place? Design all you want and you can create your own portfolio, just like I provide to clients in the studio. And then you can come back mm -hmm. and worry about which one you're going to actually buy. I spent way too much time in there <laughs> when I saw this link the first time. I'm like, oh, this is so fun. <laughs> yeah, I'll say it's a little counterintuitive or I guess maybe counter to the normal e-commerce experience. I want people to spend as much time as possible on that page. I don't want them to just, you know, jump through it and immediately go to the shopping cart. I want them to really deliberate and create as much as they can. I really love that. And I, I hadn't even I hadn't even thought about this beforehand, but it's a fun shopping experience and shopping in itself, I think for a lot of people it can be fun for my wife. It's a lot of fun for me, not always, <laughs> but for me, that experience was so much fun. It was so neat to go in there and to really feel like I'm creating something like that's, it's one of the things that you're doing with it is you're transferring some sort of creative power ability into the hands of the user. And I love that because I don't consider myself a jewelry designer, but I go into your site and I can be to some degree a jewelry designer. I can build something that resonates with me and feel like, hey, I, I did this. And I think that's a really neat part of the experience, you know? Yeah. The curation isn't quite there on a, a lot of other sites. You know, I don't ever want to say you know, I've built this Ferrari for you, go drive it without telling you how it works. I want you to feel like you're being chauffeured through the whole experience. Mm -hmm. You know, no matter what elements you combine, you're going to get a beautiful ring. And sometimes that's not the case on other tools that I've seen, but that was really my goal was I just want all of it to be beautiful. Yeah. And that comes through, right? It's like you're putting up guardrails. You kind of are saying go drive the Ferrari, but I'm going to put up guardrails on the road so that you're going to be safe. And that's how I felt because every configuration that I did and changed and played around with, I ended up with something that I'm like, oh, I really like that. You know, so I, I get what you mean about the curation. Yeah. Very cool. So Lindsay, knowing that you've kind of built this really, really powerful, interesting, addictive shopping experience. How has that really impacted your business? How has that impacted shoppers as we've kind of gone through this really big boom in e-commerce over the past year, year and a half? And what's it really done for you and your business? So it's been very interesting. So we launched December 1st, which is such a crazy time of year in the first place. But what we've seen so far is that it's definitely not the traditional e-commerce purchasing experience. Our clients get on the platform and then instead of doing, at this point, instead of doing the traditional let's add to card and let's, you know, check out because my price points are so high and it's a an emotional investment, we are getting contacted the regular way. They'll email us, they'll call us, they'll come by the studio and that's where they're converting. And so it's also had, it's had this really nice effect of doing pretty much exactly what I wanted it to do. It's bringing these, you know, beautiful rings to clients that I can't see in New York. And it's also allowing us to get to know our customers like we enjoy doing. But it's also had this really great halo effect, which I wasn't sure what to expect um, on our existing custom business with the one-of-a-kind pieces it's going in a, a really nice direction this year, especially coming out of the pandemic too. But it's had a halo effect on everything. Just having the website be more professional and have that kind of immersive experience with the virtual studio. I don't care how a client wants to become a customer of ours. They can check out online or they can contact us or they can come into the studio and whatever they want, as long as they're getting the same level of service that they were prior. It's been a nice and, you know, surprising seeing what our clients are doing. Yeah. That seems to resonate on the luxury end of things where that relationship, that authenticity is a huge part of why someone buys. And this experience with big commerce and three kid is driving that authenticity and that special premium luxury feel. And there's also, the, but there's still that important piece, which is, hey, who is the who is the creator of this thing? Yeah, you know, that's something we've heard from a lot of other luxury merchants. Is you gotta be understand the channels, right? It's not just one channel all the time. In store, online, these things come together in a a full customer narrative. It's usually not just one. 
yeah, reducing that purchasing friction, no matter where the purchase happens, is top priority, or it should be a top priority, right? I love that mantra. Mark, you guys probably see a lot of other use cases here where you're dealing with brands and merchants that want to be innovative in their shopping experience. We see that with Lindsay. Are there other things that you see that are coming that you're thinking, wow, this really, really is an innovation in shopping experience? What what, do you got, what are you guys looking at? Uh, I think there's this uh, the phrase that I really, really like. It uh, came from this book called Hitmakers, and the phrase is called Maya. The book is all about, hey, how do I create the next big hit? And they created this acronym called Maya, which is most advanced yet acceptable. That's where I, I really would encourage folks to be thinking, which is, look, virtual reality, that's interesting, but that's way, 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 way off in the future. But what's something where if someone looked at it and they said, oh, I, I think I, I understand that. I understand what a, a 3D object is. I understand how to like touch and grab something on my phone or, you know, and sort of rotate it with my phone or on the, on a browser, but it's still new. And I think that's just something that like a, a lot of folks aren't doing an immersive experience where you can grab and rotate something or show it in augmented reality, but almost everyone knows how to operate in that environment. And so it's still novel. It's still really special. You know, stats are coming out like 60% of people surveyed. It was a Harris poll of about 3,000 e-commerce shoppers. 60% said they want more 3D and augmented reality experiences. Uh, Another poll said augmented reality on a product drives conversion by 200%. So if someone puts that product in their space, they're 200% more likely to buy that product. I really think around 3D and augmented reality, these are things that people are saying they want. You don't need to think so dramatically in the future. I think you do need to start thinking if you're only doing photography right now, that is a limiting thing for you. It costs on average about $25 per finished photo. And you can only turn out so many photos. You can only do it so quickly if you have a new product coming out. And I really think you need to start thinking, hey, if there's a 3D object, I can put it in a photo or 3D or augmented reality, and I can create 50,000 photos in a weekend, You know, which is something we've done before. So the future is happening kind of right now, and it's just a little bit further ahead of just doing photos. Yeah, I think one of the other quotes or, or stats that you quoted me when we were talking a few weeks ago was that people are willing to pay a 40% premium for customized goods. Right. Did that come from you? Yeah, it was absolutely. You'd be shocked at how much more someone's willing to pay to just have their, their name inscribed mm-hmm. and you know their special pattern on something or their special logo. That's really valuable to a lot of people. And Lindsay, you could probably speak to that. I'd be actually interested in Lindsay. Do many folks come to this experience online and then say, hey, well, actually, I would like, it's just a little bit different. And then that opens up a huge opportunity for you on the, you know, super bespoke side. You know, is that is that a a part of the customer journey as well? It's 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 kind of two different experiences. So my bridal clients, my engagement clients. They are spending more than the average American on their engagement ring, but they still have a a budget kind of threshold. Mm. My clients care about craft and quality and the uh, long-term value of it. They come to me anticipating to spend more than most other Americans, but they do expect to get a lot for it. Got it. Okay. So in some ways, what you rolled out in terms of your experience and your shopping experience was you had to meet a certain level of expectation from high demand customers, right? You, you couldn't just put up a website with a bunch of pictures and say, hey, you know, pick the one that you want. That would have really pushed a number of your customers away, right? And so there's this aspect of one, as you're meeting the requirements of your customers to sustain the growth that you want out of your business at the same time. I think it's a, it's a more of a macro trend in the bridal jewelry area is you know they don't really want to pick something out of a case because it wasn't made for them. It was made for anybody. With the way manufacturing is quickly evolving and given the, the pandemic effects that have been put on the supply chain, on-demand manufacturing domestically is emerging as that vehicle to allow people to have a ring made just for them. Mm-hmm. So it's been it's been a really nice convergence of a bunch of different things on the supply chain and the manufacturing. 
It's not just in jewelry where that's happening. Yeah. On-demand manufacturing is a trend that more and more and more across all industries, people are trying to, you know, there's a demand for consumers to move faster, yeah. to personalize, to customize. And kind of like the stats we just said, it's, it's because people are willing to pay more for it. People want that. They desire the ability to say, that's mine, not I'm wearing the same exact thing yeah. that everyone else is wearing. No, that's a huge trend. And if you're an e-commerce merchant, right? And we're talking a lot about innovation now. There's innovation that you can do from a digital perspective, but this opens up opportunities to innovate on your product side as well. Stuff that you probably haven't even thought of that could open up doors for you because now there is innovation in the shopping experience to support what already exists today in that on-demand manufacturing side, which is really cool. You kind of have a convergence of of two different things coming together to provide you something that is unique and differentiated, which is really neat. We're going to stay in Charleston for a week. And I noticed that on Airbnb, there are certain places that look really nice, but they're listed for like $3,000 a night. You know what I mean? And it's sort of like, that's a little bit, uh, this is a long metaphor, but it's a little bit like on-demand manufacturing in the sense that you could say, Hey, if you want these options, it's going to be a hundred times more than normal, but there might be someone that wants that option. You know what I mean? So through this experience, you can lead these options of ultra customizable things or hyper, hyper, hyper personalization and leave it out there. Let the consumer decide. They might actually decide, Hey, you know, this place, you know, bring it back to the Airbnb. This place is only 10% better than the last place, but it's 10 times more. Some people might decide anyway, hey, I'll take that choice and I don't care if it's 10 times more. Um, and I think that's you know just one element, an interesting element, but just one element of you know on-demand and manufacturing and allowing for this complete personalization. Lindsay, I have a question. When you were going through this process, there's a spectrum here for AR, VR, right? On the very low end of this whole tech thing that we're talking about, there's taking 3D pictures, being able to spin them around, right? Then maybe if you get a little fancier, that's showing that picture, uh, that image of a product in a space that you've created. And then there's kind of what you built, which seems to be really on that leading edge of an experience where you're allowing someone to actually create something visually in a 3D environment. Did you consider the lower end or did you just know, hey, I really need to create this experience way over here? And that's what is demanded versus this lower end, easier to accomplish kind of experience. And what was your thought process there? I knew my clients would not be impressed with something that wasn't up to their expectations or that seemed a little bit, um, you know, uh, prefab, I guess. Yeah. I knew that I wanted something that felt like you were maybe sitting across from me and I was designing this, but still had that very personal and artistic environment. Yeah. It all really for you, it went back to, I want to deliver the best experience that I can for the expectations of my customers. And the lower end is not going to do it. I need to go straight over to here. And then you made that choice. Yeah. And there was a lot of like, okay, if I want this, then what do I have to sacrifice in order to get this? Because I'm always coming up with the next phase of my experience with 3 kit. <laughs> I love that. But it was, what can I, as a brand my size, afford to do right now, mm -hmm. but still get like the most luxurious output for it? It was fun. Probably my last question, but who knows? But one of the things that I was thinking about is it is often very hard. And it doesn't matter what size brand you are. You could be a big brand. You could be a little brand. But there's always seems to be trepidation in investing in shopper experience. And when you're with a bigger brand, it becomes a game of, well, how do I justify this? How do I show the value that this is going to produce? When you're a smaller brand, maybe you can, you know, jump out and take a risk, but then, you know, that's your money you're spending, right? So, and this is for both of you guys. How would you help others navigate that perplexity? in terms of understanding the value of creating a really, truly innovative shopping experience for your business? For me, it was, I did not have a choice not to do it. Like I said, a small brand in New York, I'm in the middle of the Diamond District. So I'm competing with 
1,000 other people right next door. So I didn't have a choice not to find a way to bring my designs to a larger audience Yeah. in the way that, you know, would be expected if they were to, to come into New York. And then add, add on top of that, you know, when I was first talking to 3Kit, it was prior to the pandemic. And so this was going to be, you know, a real expansion for me. And then when the pandemic happened, I thought, well, I don't have an e-commerce business and I can't bring people into my studio anymore. So I need to build this. This is the time. Mm -hmm. For me, it was, you know, I didn't really have a choice. But for anybody else, I would, you know, really understand just what kind of experience you want to offer and make sure that aligns with the product that you sell. Jewelry is a, a very broad category. And so I still feel like I'm kind of in a void in the jewelry industry itself because there's the luxury brands that haven't quite gotten to this full e-commerce capability for many reasons. And then there's brands that have dedicated their whole business to e-commerce. And so I feel like I'm kind of in the middle of that. But yeah, for anybody else, I would just try to just look at what's the DNA of your business and how can you expand it? Yeah, I like that. Mark, you have anything to add there? It's a great question. I'm a marketer and I ask my teams, hey, what's the ROI on this activity? But I also know, having been on teams before, that if you only look at ROI, if your every single thing is saying, hey, you're only going to be investing in AdWords, you know what I mean? And over time, you become that, what is it, the frog in the boiling pot, right? So like over time, you keep turning up the temperature and the frog can jump out of that boiling pot, but it doesn't jump up if you turn up the temperature slow enough. And so I think everyone knows if you do not innovate, if you just sort of keep pressing the, the lowest, most clear ROI thing, you're going to run into trouble. So this visualization world, it is early, but it's showing high ROI for folks like Lindsay Scoggins, for dozens and dozens of other brands, platforms like Shopify, Facebook, Apple are investing heavily in it. And at the end of the day too, you can get started for a pretty low cost, right? Like, so we encourage merchants to start with, hey, take one of your products that's customizable, right? And you can, in, in about eight weeks and for a not huge amount of money, you can have that thing be totally customizable in real time inside of your browser, on the phone, 3D augmented reality and virtual photography. And it's just it just isn't that big of an investment. We encourage people to start, hey, start with one product, experience it. You will see an ROI because people love this experience. Shoppers love to engage. Like we've been talking about this whole time. And then you can expand. We haven't had a single customer in two years, a trip, because they're saying this isn't working. So we haven't had a sing we haven't lost a single customer saying, oh, the people just aren't engaged and they don't like it. Which is awesome. Yeah. That's a, that is a great metric to look at in your business, right? Right. So, I mean, it's like anything, anything new, it, it takes a risk. But for a relatively small cost in a short time, start with one product is how I would advise it. So, Mark, that's how a brand would get started, maybe working with just one product. Where do you see a brand that wants to truly be innovative and a disruptor? Like, where do they take this? And what are some of these kind of bigger use cases down the road that you're seeing are going to come in the next few years? Visuals have a super, 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 super high market cap, if you will, if I can mm -hmm. explain it that way. We, and I mean collective we, everyone, spends a huge majority of their life on Twitter, YouTube, watching TV, playing video games, watching movies, Snapchat. Those are visual platforms, if you think about it. People are hyper-engaged by looking at things and scrolling. Mm -hmm. We live in an e-commerce world of infinite scroll. You want people spending that time becoming intimate and acquainted with your brand. Like Lindsay said, even if, if, someone, if someone can't convert, the next best thing you want is them spending 10, 15, 20, 30 minutes on your site, scrolling and looking at all the beautiful things that you offer. That's what I did, Lindsay, on your site. <laughs> that's what I did. That's exactly, yeah, that's exactly it. If you're a brand today and you sell a lot of different potential customizations or configurations of your product, imagine a world where you could let someone scroll for 20 or 30 minutes, seeing beautiful, beautiful renditions of every single possible configuration of your product set in different scenes. You can zoom in, zoom out, change different parts, and they're spending this immense amount of time getting to know your brand. Yeah. That is where I really, really encourage people to be thinking like, that is the beautiful future of 
wow, I'm so super immersed in this experience of the brand. And whether it's 3D or, you know, virtual photography or augmented reality, it's about creating that intimacy of a visual experience. And you cannot do that with photos. You cannot take enough photos that are going to be quality enough to get that done. You need to be able to work off of these 3D objects, these 3D shapes, whether it's with 3Kit or anyone else that are smart, that can change based on various features and rules of your product catalog. And so that's sort of the golden goose of the future of the beautiful vision of like, why do this? Yeah, It's the visuals and people love that. They already love it. It's going to keep expanding as we sort of our love affair with those, those apps and things continue. Yeah. And it's what the visuals can do in the light of constraints that exist today, right? Like Lindsay solving a, to some degree, a customization problem, right? A personalization problem. Others might want to solve catalog size problem or configuration or catalog rule problem where they've got so many different components that are part of a, a product that gets purchased and you got to piece those components together, right? This can solve that versus the traditional interface experience that we have today, which is very cumbersome to work with. So it, it seems like where you can apply this visual rendering simplistic, easy to work with approach to solve what really are today complex user experience challenges, right? And and so you've got some nice use cases there. I love it. Lindsay, you mentioned earlier, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, but you said you always have new ideas for stuff that you're thinking of with 3Kit. Is there anything that you could share? Ideas that you're, you know, you're looking into the future to to come up with to try to improve the experience even more? Outside of what you see in the virtual studio, mm -hmm. there's other efficiencies that can be implemented with their technology. You know, when it comes to just like Mark said, with photography, but also with product development, the costs for jewelry are astronomical at times. For me, if I want to create a new line of wedding bands and I want to see what they're going to look like before I decide to invest in samples and prototypes and, you know, whether or not it's going to be, you know, wholesale or direct to consumer type of program. I've done renderings with them on whole new collections that live outside the virtual studio, which have really helped me expand mm. the offerings without having to. And it's time and money, you know. That's brilliant. You use them as part of the product development process as well. And that can cut your time. And I mean, there's so many reasons <laughs> that it makes sense. The most important reason for me is it gives my clients who would typically buy something off of a sketch from me it gives them a lot more confidence in what they're going to get because yeah. they can actually see that very high quality rendering. They think it's an actual photograph. Yeah. They see what they're going to get and they feel, you know, more confident in it. I can also see, okay, it's going to look like this. I need to tweak this. You know, there's always like at every single stage of development and production, there's something that you're going to want to want to tweak in this aids and that also. This has been so amazing for me. I love Talking about this stuff, this is great innovation on both parts. You know, Lindsay, what you've been able to do with 3Kit, 3Kit, what you guys are enabling and providing out there to the world. If people want to connect with you guys, where do they go? What's the best place? Just websites, Instagram handles. The best is, uh, yeah, for us, it's uh, 3Kit.com and 3Kit on Twitter as well. But most importantly, go check out lindsayscoggins.com. Incredible, incredible jeweler, incredible experience. Lindsay, you're killing it. Thanks. With, you know, help from you guys. And also my Instagram is Lindsay Scoggins Studio, where you can see a lot of my one-of-a-kind pieces as well that don't end up making it on the site all the time. Yeah, highly recommended. Between the site where you just get absorbed into this incredible experience and the beautiful jewelry that's there, it's just absolutely amazing. What you've done, Lindsay, it's truly an innovation that a lot of brands should aspire to. And it's just fantastic. It's great work. Awesome. Guys, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Really appreciate it. Appreciate your time and have loved having you and have loved talking to you. So thank you. It's been lovely thank talking you, to you too. Thanks for listening to the Make It Big podcast. 
Want even more insights and expert advice? Experience our Make It Big conference, now available on demand. You'll get e-commerce tips and strategies from global thought leaders like Mark Cuban, Ann Handley, and Neil Patel, plus big commerce partners like Google, TikTok, and more. Watch today at bigcommerce.com slash make it big.